morning and for being cozy with us here. Um, I'm Mary Ellen Jones. I'm president of the Engine Alliance. I'd like to introduce my team who is with me. Um, Kevin Cast heads up the GE side of the program. He's executive VP for the GP7000 for the, for the West, as we call it, Grant <laughs> Whitney being the East. Um, Karana Delishen uh, manages our programs for us in Toulouse. She's based at Airbus in Toulouse. And Nathan Hicks, I think, is diligently working outside. Nathan is our marketing director based in East Hartford. Uh, you, many of you know Katie Paget, uh, and Rick Kennedy is here somewhere. And I've introduced Richard Carcaye, uh, who's head of Airbus A380 Marketing. So what we wanted to do today is just give you a general update on the GP7200 engine for the Airbus A380. Okay, there we go. okay just a little background for those of you who don't know is we've actually been around for some time now, since uh, 1996. We are a 50-50 joint venture between GE Aviation and Pratt and & Whitney, so we bring a uh, quite a strong legacy between us of 180 plus years of jet engine experience. Obviously tons of engines, 50,000 engines in service, and you know we quite firmly believe that we do have uh, superior technology uh, and capability and great people resources as well. So we come from a very strong heritage. <laughs> Giving away Obviously not a strong IT heritage. Okay. Um, we do have uh, a very nice order book so far, nearly 600 engines on order. Uh, you can see our rather stellar list of customers. 56% um, market share, that is the way we like it, uh, versus the competition. Um, three of these customers are currently in service. Um, Air France, Korean Air, and Emirates are currently are flying with a GP engine. Um, and I'll show you here. We do have 34 uh, airplanes in service with our engine. You see some of the stats here. Uh, Emirates is coming up with their fourth anniversary. They entered service in August of 08, followed by Air France, and then Korean Air just had their one year anniversary. And you can see Korean in particular took their aircraft in quite quick succession. I think they took five airplanes in five months last year. Um, and you know they're, they're doing quite well. All three operators are very happy with the profitability, the money-making, passenger appeal capabilities of the A380, and the reliability and performance of uh, the GP. This is a chart we borrowed from Airbus. Uh, it shows our customer's root structure, which as you imagine, as the fleet is growing, our uh, customer root structure is growing as well. Uh, Emirates in particular just announced they were going to add a second flight to New York. I guess they're going to start to service to Washington. So they're really expanding their footprint in the U.S., which is great. Uh, I think Kareen is going to start uh, Atlanta service later this year when they get their new airplanes. So you know, everybody's reaching out and going far and wide. Uh, this is our fleet scorecard, which we monitor quite closely. Um, this green is intentional. I mean, these are our metrics. So our metrics are all green, uh, and they have been for quite some time. Um, you know, very proud of our reliability performance. Our customers really demand that. Um, you know, we've, we've got, you know, our 34 airplanes in service. Uh, what do we say? That's 136 engines plus spares. Uh, and these are some of our stats. Um, and we, we are touting today, we've got a news release just noting that we, you know, we have reached the one million hour milestone. We did that right at the beginning of July. So that's a nice milestone for us. Uh, obviously we have millions more to go. So it's nice to hit that first one. Um, we are very proud, and those of you who we've met with before know uh, that we, you know, this really is our claim to fame, the, the fuel burn advantage on the GP. Um, you know, Airbus is quite diligent in monitoring their engine supplier's performance, uh, and then they provide a performance handbook to their customers to show what the airplane engine uh, combination is capable of. Um, so we did get uh, our third adjustment to the Airbus handbook, or orange book, uh, just a few months ago, um, which we're very proud of because Airbus is quite... Uh, I won't say persnickety, but quite focused on making Me, sure we <laughs> deliver. I mean, they want they, they, and, and what's important is this is based on demonstrated performance. It's not based on promises. It's based on what we have actually um, performed in service. So it me means a lot to us. Um, so and that obviously translates into benefits for our customers. You know, quite a lot of fuel savings, which translates into CO2 savings, uh, and uh, you know, obviously cost savings as well. You know, based on our. Um, advantage versus the competition, uh, our customers, you know, are saving uh, quite a bit of money on fuel uh, and, you know, CO2 uh, 
uh, compared to the other guys. And if that's the third adjustment, what's your yes. total saving? What were the previous two? Um, it was, I think, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0.5, so 1.3% over time. Okay, thank you. Since December 07. And that is because of uh, changes you've made? With it's, it's kind of, it writes some in-service learning, um, and then it is, uh, and it, it, but, but some of it is too. Airbus likes to see their performance. They, mm -hmm. they go gradually. Right. You know, they don't want to give you a big jump all at once, so they want to see the performance demonstrate it and ensure it's sustainable. So they have done this in yeah. steps. Just for one quick word on that, uh, these adjustments are only made when there's a statistically significant mm -hmm. uh, set of results from the number of the delivery flights on customer aircraft. Mm -hmm. It is real world significant deltas that we see compared to the baseline performance book and then when that is consistently uh, better in the cause of the engineers then we and that is a program decision that is what a chief engineer to decide. So right. there's no marketing or, or right. estimation or it is actually realized delivered performance. Do, sorry, do you say only on pre-delivery flights? Not yeah, uh, we measure not from each airline service. Aircraft. I mean, all it really is a measure performance from day one, be it this engine or the other engine. Mm -hmm. uh, but we measure, of course, every aircraft for compliance demonstration to the customer. Okay. And does that factor in your contract guarantees for performance? It, it can, yes. I mean, customers, you know, because as Richard said, this this is demonstrated, so they want us to put our, our money where our mouth is, and we're quite comfortable with that because it is demonstrated. It's not a promise, it's a fact. Also, I've generally heard of the 1 million fuel cost savings associated with a 1% increase in, in fuel burn, but this is 0 0.5. Is well, no, this, it's been the, the, the overall, the cumulative. Right, okay. right. Okay. So that's most fuel efficient, okay. Um, but we're not content with that. We want to make sure we secure and lock in these improvements as well. Again, you know, mindful of Airbus's view that, you know, these changes, these improvements we make need to be sustainable. So we're not stopping. We are all about continuous improvement. So we're announcing today that we are making some additional enhancements in several areas of the engine, uh, the high compressor, some externals, some duct work, uh, and in the high turbine section of the airplane. Um, now, this is not anything we're necessarily claiming a lot of credit for. You know, it's just maybe a couple of tenths here or there, but it's something that we want to do to make sure, you know, we're taking our learning from service and we want to lock in the fuel burn advantage, the performance advantage that we enjoy today. And I think this just gives Airbus further confidence that we are incorporating, you know, sustainable improvements to the engine. Will these improvements go into existing engines? These are more forward-looking improvements, right? I think um, the, the HPT blades can be, you know, when, when yep. an engine comes in for a shop visit, yep. uh, then the new blades can be incorporated as needed. Can you be more specific about that improvement in the blade? Yeah, it's an it's a, a improved blade really more for durability in that severe Middle East environment. We've kind of optimized the cooling hole configuration, again, as a product of learning uh, as we've gone on, you know, particularly with our service with Emirates. So cooling flow or cooling hole? Cooling hole. Configuration, just optimization in the cooling hole configuration. And, you know, those of you who've been here before, we've talked about our weight savings as part of our continuous improvement initiative. We've taken about 200 pounds of weight out of the engine over time. We've got another modest improvement here of maybe eight or so pounds. So, you know, and, and we got to that 200 by doing, you know, some chunks of three and five and 15 pounds. We recently did a new turbine exhaust case that saved us 50 pounds. So we keep, you know, hunting, you know, all around the engine uh, for areas of opportunity. Uh, and the main thing here is, you know, we want to you know, we enjoy our, you know, what we view as our leadership position on the A380 today. We want to make sure we enjoy that for years to come, and that our customers enjoy that for years to come. Um, you know, I mentioned already the CO2 benefit that you get from the fuel, the fuel efficiency. You know, there's obviously many other areas of environmental performance as well. Noise, as I'm sure you all know, with the A380 is incredible. You know, stage four minus 17 dB. Uh, engines are obviously uh, you know, a huge contributor to that. Uh, you know, QC2 compliance was a key requirement for the A380 to enter service, and you know, does that uh, with shining efficiency. Um, and then it's not just about CO2. There's NOx, you know, hydrocarbon, smoke, and, and the other emissions factors, uh, all of which we need uh, you know, for, for currently anticipated regulations. Again, something important to Airbus, something important to our mutual customers.
just maybe one quick word as well here from the, the QC levels. Uh, we are certificating another weight variant, which is within, well within the existing envelope, which would be a 490 tons maximum takeoff weight definition of the aircraft, as opposed to the 560 tons standard basic uh, maximum takeoff weight, if I can say that. Uh, and that will be QC1. Yet another <coughs> opening of operational freedom for the three operators after the moment. So that is an interesting addition, which will do a good number of routes. One to the very longest routes, but uh, you can have a QC1 and 380 for a lot of interesting high volume routes. And the airlines can do the math on the QC system, which you know if you don't, then just, uh, just read up on it because it's going to spread around the world, I'm sure, over the coming years. Mm -hmm. Did you want to just Remind the folks of the 575 airplane as well? Yes, just to, to complement that, and that's something we've shown to the media in May in our Innovation Day event. Uh, we have four aircraft beginning in 2013, a maximum takeoff weight option of 575 metric tons, and that will do uh, everything and more uh, in terms of range and payload capability that goes for also uh, up to uh, eight more tons of structural payload capability and that is something which is linked to our commercial activity around the world and also to some existing customers uh, requirements so the h 80 as you see here with the engine the h 80 also has been steadily uh, developing its uh, envelope of capabilities tweaking exploiting results of fatigue testing and so on Now, you know, fuel efficiency, environmental efficiency are, are one aspect of, you know, providing value and, and providing overall life cycle cost benefits. Another key area there is maintenance cost as well. I mean, our customers hopefully are going to be operating this equipment for 15, 20 or more years, so we need to look at the total life cycle cost. So, you know, we, we are very focused on maintenance cost and on maintainability of the engine. Uh, you know, the reliability helps a lot there. Obviously, you want that engine to stay on wing as long as possible, uh, so that lowers your maintenance burden right off the bat. Um, we, you know, in order to contain costs as well, we do have a large and growing repair portfolio, you know, which helps us control costs. We've got, I don't know, hundreds of hundreds, repairs yeah. certainly um, on the books right now. And then we're also conscious of, you know, of logistics and other savings opportunities for our customer. Uh, the propulsor concept is something we borrowed quite liberally from the GE90. Um, where we can split the engine from the fan module, leaving us the propulsor. So this helps our customers in a number of ways. When a customer buys spare engines, um, they can buy one full spare with the fan and then supplement that with some propulsor. So you don't have to buy a fleet of full spares. You can buy a full and then some propulsors because the fan is interchangeable. And it's primarily when, it, when it's time for maintenance, it's the core of the propulsor that needs to go in the shop. So that helps, you know, certainly from an acquisition cost, that's a benefit. From a shipping um, standpoint, it's also a benefit because, you know, the fan, it's 116 inches, so there are some limitations as to what, as to what freighters you can ship it in. Um, when you ship the propulsor, you've got a lot more options. It's obviously less expensive and just easier to handle. Um, so this is something that, you know, is a, I mean, was certainly very popular on the GE90, and we're quite happy to have adapted it for the GP. So what we really try to do is drive total life cycle cost uh, benefit for our customers. Um, and we've got this new campaign about delivering value, and here's kind of our million dollar, million hours, million dollars. We've kind of got a theme going here, um, but you know we're, you know we're all about delivering value, cost efficiency, fuel efficiency, performance benefits to our customers, um, and they they do tell us they're quite satisfied, quite happy with the airplane and with the engine. And that's it. Just wanted to give you a brief update, uh, you know, tell you how proud we are of what we've done so far, um, how happy we are to be working with Airbus, and uh, you know, looking for more good things to come. We can certainly take any of the questions you have or pour you more coffee, whatever, whatever you need. I just wanted to understand one thing. Uh, this is when we talk of this engine, it's about the routine jet fuel. But suppose what, sometimes the customer wants to use the biojet fuel. Mm -hmm. In that case, would there be some changes in the engine or the same engine would be? No, the same engine. I mean, the, the biofuel industry is really adapting the fuel to match the engines. You don't need to match the engines for the fuel. So, you know, there's, there's standards set by ASTM 
uh, for biofuels, and you know, there obviously there's been a lot of progress made. So I think the, the key issue right now on biofuels is quantity and availability. Uh, but certainly, as we start, you know, getting more advanced in that area, yes, this engine could absolutely handle. Biofuels. So you don't need to upgrade the engine. No, no. no they, in fact, I've talked to our engineers about that. You know, she, you know. Would you adapt the engine to the fuel? And they said, absolutely not. You really need to adapt the fuel to the engine. Mm -hmm.